For thousands of years, civilization has been a destructive force, both ecologically and culturally. Deep in the abyss of the sixth extinction, the future of humanity and our other-than-human kin hangs by a thread. At this pivotal moment in time, we must reach back into the depths of the human story and uncover our mistakes. I invite you to go with me down the rabbit hole as I seek out the silenced, forgotten, buried, abandoned, and demonized stories and practices of regenerative, egalitarian, place-based cultures. There is still time to reconnect with what we have lost, to restore our broken relationships to the land where we dwell, and to remember the human place in the wild. Hello, and welcome to the Rewilding Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Michael Bauer. I'm coming to you from Portland, Oregon, the traditional territory of the Multnomah and Clackamas Chinookan people, as well as the Kalapuya, Malala, Cowlitz, and many other tribal groups who have lived here, subsisted here, and traveled here to trade and make their living since time immemorial. This podcast is produced in partnership with Rewild Portland, a nonprofit organization and is made possible through financial support from our listeners. The best way to keep the podcast going is to become a recurring monthly supporter. If you feel inspired to contribute, you can make a donation by following the link in the podcast notes. You can also help by sharing our podcast on social media and writing us a review on iTunes. All right. I wanted this first podcast to be essentially about how I think about rewilding. Um, I know there's a lot of different definitions floating around out there, um, a lot of people using it pretty differently than the way I do. And so as an introductory podcast, I wanted to just put it out there what rewilding means to me and what rewilding means in the context of this podcast. So where to begin? Um, I think I'll begin by just kind of talking a little bit about myself so you get a sense of who I am. Um, and my biography in regards to how I am oriented around the term rewilding and how I perceive it as a movement and how I'm oriented in that movement. So my journey into rewilding started, you know, I mean, of course I could track it back to like earlier and earlier, depending on what events in my childhood I wanted to really get into. But I think for the main part of the story, when I feel like I really became uh, 100% completely motivated into rewilding as a lifestyle before I had the word to describe it, but still doing the thing was when I was 16 years old. Um, I had recently hung out. It was it was the last day of high school, actually, of my sophomore year. And a friend of mine who was dropping out of high school uh, ended up hanging out with me. And she had just become a vegan and was sort of railing about factory farming and how horrible the conditions were and describing it in depth to me. And of course, I, uh, I had never really thought about, I mean, I, that's not true. I definitely thought about factory farming before, but as a teenager, I just didn't really care all that much. And as I was sort of coming into my own and realizing more and more my sphere of influence was growing beyond childhood and into adulthood, I started to care more about those things. And so interacting with my friend who was already kind of on that level and um, advocating that I become a vegan based on the, the factory farm experience of animals. So over the summer, I just decided to become a vegetarian um, after my conversation with her. And it was on a camping trip up climbing Mount Bailey to finish a film project I had with a friend where as soon as we reached the summit of Mount Bailey, a thunderstorm moved in and basically started pouring down rain and cast us off the summit because we didn't want to get stuck up there in case we got, you know, lightning started flashing all around us. So we were like, we have to get off uh, and back down to the timber line so we aren't just um, sitting targets up here. So we ran down and... (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it was flash flood conditions. So I just grabbed onto this pine tree that was at the top of this mountain. And I just kind of held on and hunkered down underneath thinking that that was going to keep me somewhat dry or something, you know, but the wind was kicking up and there was just rain everywhere. And I was holding onto this pine tree that was swaying all around. It wasn't very big, you know, it was maybe, I don't know, five, six inches in diameter at the base. And so it was just kind of not a sapling, but not quite a, a fully grown tree or anything. So I was kind of swaying in the wind with it. And I just had this experience where I was like, wow, this tree is 
alive. I could feel the like electrostatic current of the thunderstorm and the tree and all of it kind of coursing through me. And I realized that I had, you know, on the walk down, I was really contemplating plant existence in this way that I hadn't before. And I was starting to do some of the math in my head, you know, thinking, well, I'm a vegetarian because of factory farming, and I don't think that animals should be kept in pens. But if plants experience something analogous to pain, analogous to suffering, if they are not in their quote unquote natural conditions, then isn't that also messed up? And so I started thinking about like farming and how plants are taken out of um, their environments and planted in rows and sprayed with pesticides and genetically modified and all these kinds of things. And at 16, I was like, wow, this is really messed up. And I realized I'm kind of creating a spiritual hierarchy here that doesn't really fully make sense to me. So I ceased to be a vegan and I think unbeknownst to me or unknowingly, um, because I didn't have a word for it at the time, became an animist. And so I was describing this experience to a friend of mine who recommended a Tom Brown Jr. book, The Vision, in which he um, she earmarked a chapter for me in which he allegedly hunted a deer, essentially with his bare hands, and became very, very in a deep relationship with the deer over the summer so that it wouldn't react to him. And then at the end of the summer, he killed the deer uh, basically betraying the trust that he had developed with this animal. And um, part of the lesson for him and what he was teaching in that book was um, that one should have that amount of feeling for all living things, um, even things that we might not perceive as living too, including like rocks and clouds and things like that. Um, so I read that book and I got really into it. And I read, I read the chapter on the way home, um, on the way to school one day. And um, I basically had this sort of realization where this person who gave me the book, we had constant conversations about things. And so I was experiencing this feeling like I, I wanted to be a better person. I wanted to connect with plants and animals. I didn't feel like I had an inner desire in me to be destructive. And I went home that weekend and I watched uh, the movie Terminator 2. And at the end of the film, Arnold Schwarzenegger says to John Connor, it's in your nature to destroy yourselves. And I remember thinking, I don't believe that, but I keep hearing people say that kind of thing. Why? Why are people saying this? And so I, I started you know, bringing it up philosophically with my friends and my friend Lisa, the one who had convinced me to become a vegetarian um, for the summer, her and I connected and had this conversation in which she was like, well, basically you need to read this book Ishmael by Daniel Quinn because it explains everything that you're talking about. And so I read Ishmael by Daniel Quinn in two days and I dropped out of high school the following week, um, which happened to be Halloween. And my thinking behind dropping out of high school was Daniel Quinn's book Ishmael summed up exactly those feelings of humans are not inherently flawed, but it's something that we tell ourselves because of the cultural system that we've created. And when I say we, I'm not talking about humanity. So I'm talking about a very specific type of society. Generally, we call it civilization, but there's very specifics about when I say our civilization. I'm talking not about the Bushmen. I'm talking about, for example, um, Western civilization or the civilizations that emerged out of the Fertile Crescent and so, which we'll get into, I'm sure, later in the podcast, but the idea being that the way that we're living is not only unsustainable, we're telling ourselves that it that humans are inherently flawed and there's not a lot we can do about it. Um, and so after reading his book, which kind of outlines a lot of those things, I realized that, well, I felt the sense of urgency. And the sense of urgency was civilization is going to collapse in my lifetime. I have spent the last 16 years without really learning the things necessary, aside from maybe like Boy Scout stuff, the things I that are necessary for living without globalism, living without the current economic structures of civilization. And diving deep into Daniel Quinn's work, it was clear that 
the more sustainable way of life that we can see is the hunter-gatherer or specifically immediate return hunter-gatherer. However, Daniel Quinn doesn't get into those terms, but we will on this podcast because that's a very important distinction um, that I find a lot of value in. So I thought to myself, what good is a high school diploma going to be in a post-apocalypse, essentially? Um, and I don't really subscribe much to the uh, the apocalypse imagery or the ideas of collapse per se anymore. So uh, my perspective has changed a lot over the last 20 years. But at the time, I felt this urgency, like I have to learn survival skills um, so that when civilization collapses, which was going to be next year, you know, I was 16, I had just read this, I felt this deep sense of urgency. I need those skills and I'm not getting them here in compulsory education. Uh, I was so driven that I tried to talk to my parents who were divorced at the time. E- each one, I tried to explain to each side um, what I was doing, and they just had no idea. They It's not that they really thought I was crazy, per se. They just thought I was like an ignorant teenager who didn't really understand the way the world works. And so they would try to explain things to me. And you know, after a, a lifetime of telling me to follow my heart— and do what makes me happy. When it came time to actually do that, it went against the the you know the mainstream um, narratives, and that was really hard for them. So I basically felt that I had one choice, which was to run away from home. So I ran away from home, and I couch surfed while bagging groceries, and found a couple of mentors to teach me ancestral skills or what I, I basically called them survival skills back then. I didn't understand the distinction eventually saving up money. And I called the tracker school in New Jersey, which was Tom Brown school. And I asked them, you know, I'm 16. I want to come to the program. Can I come and learn survival skills? And they basically were like, sorry, um, you have to be 18 and over. You can't come. So I was pretty disappointed. But, you know, this is before the internet. This is like 1998. And um, two weeks later, the secretary from the school called me back. She had, you know, written my number down and kept it in a file somewhere called me back and was like, hey, just so you know, we're we're going to be offering a, a teenage summer camp um, coming up here this summer, and you could totally come to that. So I convinced three of my other friends, who were all also high school dropouts, to, uh, we, had, we had our little dropout um, rewilding club, although we didn't really use the word rewilding, um, but we were obsessed with Tom Brown and Daniel Quinn and uh, basically trying to figure out how to, you know, learn to survive and that kind of stuff um, together. It was really great to have that cohort of friends whose couches I could sleep on, essentially, who also believe the same things, whose parents were a bit more willing or maybe even absentee to just accept the fact that they were doing something alternative to the mainstream in terms of compulsory education. So, I don't know if I would have really been able to do what I did and have done without having that cohort. That social cohort was so important to my personal development and our collective development. And so I just, every day I'm kind of thankful when I think about, think back to that and how lucky I was to have that kind of support in terms of like a team essentially that dropped out together. That's not saying that there weren't really challenging times or that, you know, we were like, all super stoked about each other all the time. There was definitely a lot of like high school drama going on between all of us, but there was still this sort of collective rite of passage that we did together. And um, that kind of connection isn't really something you can ever sever. So anyway, I convinced the three other folks to uh, go across the country to Tom Brown Jr.'s high school or not, not even high school. It was like a teenager. I think it was ages 12 to 17. And so it took me eight months to save up the money to buy a Greyhound bus ticket. And at that point we had been, you know, already kind of influenced in the the Tom Brown culture, had met a few folks. I had um, bootleg audio cassette copies of this tape series called Seeing Through Native Eyes, which is highly problematic in the contemporary era, but not really something we thought about back then, considering that it's essentially a white man. But anyway, uh, so we had these like bootleg copies of John Young seeing through native eyes and we would listen to them on our Walkmans on the bus and stuff like that. Um, and he was going to be at this camp. So I'm making this a really long story now, but anyway, we went out to there to New Jersey. It took us seven days, um, round trip on a Greyhound. We actually spent more time on the Greyhound bus than we did at the actual camp, which is kind of hilarious. Um, but that camp was really our first introduction to 
a lot of the contemporary um, outdoor education and ancestral skills and survival skills community that exists in the United States and did in the late 90s and, and has reverberated and continued to um, up until now. And that's largely through organizations like Wilderness Awareness School um, and other organizations that John Young has started through his Eight Shields program and stuff like that. So we met John at, uh, they called us the Oregon Crew um, at Coyote Camp is what they originally called it. It was the very first year. I think it's called Coyote Tracks now. That was our introduction. And John was, at the time, had two of his mentor mentees there, uh, Donaga Murdoch and Justin Shetler or Justin Alexander. And after we got back from the camp, I convinced two of them, so the three out of the four of us, ended up moving and going to the community school. But I couldn't really, um, I was working five days a week at a hardware store and then going to this homeschool community school program at Wilderness Awareness School two days a week. So I didn't really have any time off and it was driving me crazy. And I only was able to last a couple of months. So I moved back to Portland. But up there, I met a whole new crew of people that were from Portland that were participating in other WASP programs or Wilderness Awareness School programs who eventually moved back to Portland as well. And we created this whole scene here, here in Portland. Um, and that's when I started actually working in environmental education uh, down here. But also, you know, I didn't mention this, but my dream as a child was to be in uh, a filmmaker and to make movies. And I had, before I dropped out of school because I thought civilization was going to collapse, you know, uh, my plan was to go to USC um, for film. And so I kind of had this weird dichotomy of like, okay, well, civilization hasn't collapsed. I'm learning skills. I'm working for outdoor ed. And now um, I ended up getting into Joseph Campbell from the folks who I had met up at Wilderness Awareness School, which was um, Willem Larson and Jen Anderson. So we started watching um, The Power of Myth by Joseph Campbell. And I got really into the idea and excited about the idea that I could still um, be learning ancestral technology, be, be kind of transitioning into another way of life, but also potentially be working on films and storytelling and revive that other passion of mine as a way of bridging the worlds and convincing more people what we what was to come. And um, so I ran this independent film screening, sort of like an open mic style thing in Portland. And uh, originally we had it at this anarchist art gallery called Martial Art, which is pretty funny, but it was in the basement there. It looked kind of like the Fight Club basement. So, you know, this is like 98 to 2003, probably. And at each screening, we would ask people a question that they would answer with a movie to show at the next one. And I don't remember what question it was, but it was in this sort of um, milieu, milieu of environmentalist filmmaking. I mean, we would ask questions like, where will you go when you die? What is inspiration? What is friendship? What does it mean to be an adult? Um, but the theme was essentially creating more and more environmental consciousness through this sort of film collective. Um, and I don't remember what the question was, but in this space is where the Urban Scout project emerged. And originally it was a project that was supposed to be a guy who was living in a post-apocalyptic society had come back to the ruins of Portland where nobody lived anymore so that he could watch the ghosts of his ancestors who didn't realize they were dead continue to go to work and do the thing. So there was going to be a monologue of that, of him kind of talking about what had happened 500 years before and how nobody goes back to the ruins because it's filled with these ghosts who don't understand they're dead. And it was just going to be me in a loincloth, um, watching people go to work like on the bus mall and stuff so i had a friend film me walking around and you know i covered myself in like mud it was a pretty poor camo job but the idea was just you know it was more for the idea than the actual um aesthetic of it and so we just went around all day and filmed me kind of like batman or something perched on you know rooftops and buildings and hiding and stuff and he was like why don't you go into a coffee shop and buy a cup of coffee and I was like, no, the point of this is that they're all dead. You can't interact with any of them. Uh, but he kept nagging me and nagging me and nagging me. And finally, I did it. And um, he filmed a, a few clips of it and cut it together and showed it. Uh, and I didn't even end up editing the piece that we originally were working on because of this other piece that we had created. And he called it Urban Scout, which was... Um, Harken back to Tom Brown Jr., who in the way of the scout had called himself an urban scout for living in um, Central Park as a, essentially a homeless person, but 
invisibly and more along the lines of with the land or something along. I don't really subscribe to a lot of that anymore. I know how true any of it is, but um, it was an interesting mythology to kind of originate some of the stuff. So the idea of Urban Scout, I had had, um, when I was 19, I had cut the soles out of my shoes and stitched in the top part of a sock into the top of the shoe so I could slip them on and it looked like I had shoes and socks on, but I was essentially barefoot. And this was um, what I would call a Trojan horse to get into uh, restaurants and things like that that had the no shoes, no shirt signs on them because I wanted to go barefoot for a year. And so I went barefoot for a year, but in order to continue getting into these places, I wanted to disguise the fact that I was actually barefoot so I could go into the um, restaurants and places like that. So I had these shoes and we called them Urban Scout shoes based on this. So the, the concept of the Urban Scout was something that was sort of like in the zeitgeist of Tom Brown stuff. And because we all lived in the urban context here in Portland, it made sense. Uh, of course, the idea of calling this character Urban Scout who went into a coffee shop covered in mud and poor camouflage was essentially like a clown. Like we, he wasn't actually scouting. He wasn't actually invisible. He was just like buying a cup of coffee and reading the the local newspaper at a table outside. Um, and it was a funny vignette of him just walking in, buying a cup of coffee, leaving this coffee shop and sitting there and drinking a cup of coffee. And like he walks by a bunch of people. And this is like in 2003, nobody flinched, nobody looked, nobody cared. And that was part of the humor of this was that this is just Portland. You know, this is well before Portlandia um, came in and capitalized on sort of the uniqueness of people here. But anyway, people loved that little short. And so I wrote about 15 little shorts for the character. They wanted to see more. And I eventually combined it all, combined all the shorts into a um, short film. And we filmed it that summer. And while we were filming it, we wanted to kind of create buzz for this short film and for the character. So I would actually go around town in character as Urban Scout by myself, just interacting with the public. And um, when I had first come back from that Coyote Tracks program when I was 16, I was walking through the bus mall in downtown Portland and I had my bow drill kit and my backpack. And somebody was like, excuse me, do you have a light for their cigarette? And I um, I kept walking. I said, no, sorry. I kept walking. And then I, I, I stopped and I said, actually, well, I do, but do you mind waiting a minute? And they were like, well, what do you mean? And so I, t I pulled out my bow drill kit and started working on it right there on the sidewalk. And it just got this huge crowd of people who came in. When I got the coal and blew it into flames, everybody applauded and like, you know, five or six people lit their cigarettes. And so I actually did that a bunch of times, just bow, I called it bow drill busking. So we incorporated that into the character of Urban Scout. So when I started going around in character as Urban Scout, I would do this thing where I would have like a glass jar, like I was spanging or um, asking for spare change, but I would light people's cigarettes. And there was a cardboard sign that said, like, we'll light your cigarette for change. And so, you know, people would come up to me and ask me questions and all of these questions, I had to stay in character. So they would influence this character in a lot of ways. You know, people were like, well, where are you getting your food? Um, and at tracker school, they had taught us that a great way for people who don't have a lot of access to hunting or um, animal husbandry, you know, one great way to get food is roadkill. And so as an urban person without a lot of access to those things, I started picking up roadkill a lot. So that was like an easy answer. You know, well, I trap and I hunt a little bit and I do, I eat roadkill and, you know, people just love that. And so just going on with Urban Scout, uh, you know, going out and building this character, eventually it became, uh, you know, we wanted to create a MySpace account for it. To, again, this is right when MySpace was becoming a thing. And so we created a Friendster and then a MySpace and, you know, you have to fill out all the info about their personality and characteristics, what kind of music and all these things. So we, you know, I, I created a lot of this concept of what Urban Scout believed and thought. And his political philosophy was what we called preemptive post-apocalyptic anarcho-neo-paleoism, which now I just call rewilding. But back then it was sort of, again, the sort of comical way of like combining all the, these different labels and narratives that we had because we didn't really have a word that in fully described exactly what we were trying to say. And so along the way, one day I was out walking by myself and I was walking down Hawthorne in Portland and this truck like screech pulls over and this guy jumps up and he runs up to me. I'm standing there. I'm in my loincloth I'm covered in my like mud camouflage. I've got like my little satchel, on, you know, my bow drill bow. I'm carrying it over my shoulder and he's like, Hey, what's going on? What are you doing? You know? And I was like, well, I'm, I'm just walking. What do you mean? And he's like, well, how come you're like dressed like this? And I was like, well, I'm a urban hunter gatherer. And um, you know, I'm I'm a preemptive post-apocalyptic anarcho neo paleoist. I'm living as if civilization has already collapsed, so that when it does, it won't be that big of a deal. 
<laughs> um, and he was just like so blown away and so excited that this was real and that there was a person doing this. And he was like, how do I get, can I get classes from you? Can I, you know, I want to learn. Um, how do I get in contact with you? And I was like, well, um, I've got a MySpace account. <laughs> um, and so he drove off. I think he must have realized pretty shortly that it was a ruse. But his excitement actually made me really depressed because while I had created this character that I wanted to see in the world, I was sad that it wasn't real. And so that was a huge turning point, that conversation with that guy. Because at that point, I realized I didn't want to pretend to be this hero character. I wanted to actually live this way and emulate it and see if I could even. And so that's when the Urban Scout character, like the movie character, sort of blended and ended up becoming more of an alter ego blogging persona. Um, Because my plan was to, I created a blog called The Adventures of Urban Scout. And the plan was I was going to keep track and um, document my experiences trying to be Urban Scout. So what would it actually require to live this way? What are the legalities? What are the challenges? What are the skills necessary? What am I lacking in skills? And within two weeks of trying this, my plan failed miserably because I didn't have the skills. I didn't understand fully what was going to be required. But most importantly, there was no community backing up this whole experience. And that was kind of, again, you know, this experiment, this two-week experiment made me realize how important community is. People didn't evolve singular individualists in a vacuum. We evolved together. So there's a level of efficiency and shared knowledge and shared skill that is skills that are deeply important in order to actually exist in the world. And we have this concept of survival, of being this sort of like mountain man rugged individualist, but that's impossible. No one actually has ever lived that way. That is um, that is a myth, and it's a myth that continues to be perpetuated and continues to hinder real growth. And so I realized then and there that the blog wasn't going to be so much a documentation of me moving into an Urban Scout lifestyle as much as it was going to be a deeper exploration of what rewilding is and a collection of persuasive essays around why rewilding is important and why people need to do it. So at this point was the shift in terms of finding the term rewilding. So I had read Green Anarchy's magazine for several years. There's an issue that had come out in 2004 about what they called rewilding. And rewilding was essentially described as what I would say the practice of anarcho-primitivism, which is now primal anarchy. We, we call it primal anarchy instead. But back then, rewilding was doing the theories, right? It's living these theories, living this ideology. To me, they're all kind of wrapped into the one, and I just prefer using the word rewilding now instead of either anarcho-primitivism or primal anarchy. I still use those because they're useful. But to me, rewilding is the act of doing the thing. It's one of the definitions, one of the things. We'll talk more about that later. But um, So I got into this word rewilding, and there was a website at the time at rewild.org, which is probably a lot of different organ- different <laughs> websites altogether now. But back then, rewild.org was a website put together by the group that created the Wild Roots Collective um, in North Carolina. And they had created a zine called Reclaim Rewild in the early aughts. And somebody essentially gave them land in North Carolina so that they could basically live as close to their ideology as possible. So there was this pocket of um, primal anarchists that were exploring these concepts of rewilding, and that was really inspiring to me. I wanted to take that, synthesize all of the definitions I found online into one that sort of made the most sense to me at the time, and then create an online collective for learning and sharing, because in the urban context, there isn't a huge amount of opportunities to do the type of rewilding I thought was necessary back then. Also, just utilizing the internet as a social tool. Back then, there was no Facebook, really. There were just online internet boards. And so we created rewild.com as an online international forum for people to discuss this kind of rewilding. 
through rewild.com. This is at the same time I was blogging as Urban Scout and, and writing about rewilding. And so we ended up networking a whole bunch of different people into the rewild website, which actually kind of started when the Daniel Quinn bulletin board shut down, which was called Ishcon. And so a lot of the people from there were looking for an alternative. And so they came to rewild.com and it kind of immediately had this population of people who are already on the same page about civilization and the origins and the reasons why our culture is unsustainable. And at the same time, a lot of people were disappointed with Daniel Quinn's response, which was essentially he was surprised that people were creating this or coming up with the concept of rewilding inspired by his work because he didn't really see that as the product of what he was aiming for with his work, I found out later, which is very strange to me. You know, it's sort of that thing of when you create something, you don't exactly know what it's going to, what shape it's going to take. And I think he maybe didn't, in one of his books, I think it was his autobiography, Providence, he talks about how he wanted, when he wrote Ishmael, he wanted to make it a manual for change in a way that showed people the bars of the cage. His idea was that we're stuck in this, we're stuck in captivity and we don't see the bars to our cage. And so Ishmael was supposed to illuminate the bars of the cage. And I think that it did that on a large part, but I think he was still not able to fully see some of the bars that other people were once they had his lens. Um, And so anyway, moving forward, I got into some John Zerzan and Kevin Tucker's work and a lot of the other anarcho-primitivists and primal anarchists at the time that were writing through Green Anarchy, and um, including Jason Gadeski and Willem Larson and Wilder Ricks and Emily Porter and other folks that were all kind of collaborating in this way. And then our website I created, I synthesized the definition of rewilding to be to return to a more natural or wild state, the process of undoing domestication. Um, You see that definition pop up everywhere online now. That was my synthesis from 2006. And um, it's interesting to see it in so many places now, especially because I've grown so much from them that I actually don't even define it the same way. Um, I find that definition very limiting and um, problematic, to say the least. But um, that's where we were at the time, and that's what we're going to keep exploring in this podcast. So... um, At rewild.com, people were really satisfied with the fact that they finally had somebody to talk to about these issues. All the people were kind of similar to me finding the word rewilding. Like, we didn't know there was a word for what we were doing. Um, And so it blew up. Uh, The heyday of the rewild.com forum was probably 2007 to 2009. And that's because um, it was the heyday of blogging. And so many of us were blogging and then leading people to the forum to have conversations about it. Uh, Facebook and other social media has really usurped a lot of those bulletin boards now, which is uh, you know a shame for so many reasons we don't even have to go into right now. But um, so on the forum, people were excited. They finally had found uh, a community to people to talk to about these things. The main problem that I saw was that nobody was really creating anything in real life. Um, no one was creating, taking the online rewilding platform and making it happen in their own city. And so that was where I wanted to make the flip. I wanted to leverage the forum to create communities of rewilding where people were at. So if people were inspired by the forum, they'd have a instruction manual or something along those, along those lines that would help them actually meet other people in their area and turn them onto the concepts of rewilding if they weren't already. And um, we called them re, we called these Skillshares Rewild Camp. It was based off this um, tech industry platform actually called bar camp but then the uh, the word camp became confusing because of the nature of rewilding being outdoors people thought it was an actual camp where people were camping anyway so we changed it to a skillshare instead of um rewild camp it changed it to be called rewild skillshares but essentially in doing this um a lot of these sprung up there were a lot of really great um skillshares that happened i went to a couple up in the bellingham area that were amazing Um, that were queer-led and totally revolutionized my way of thinking, especially about rewilding and just land projects and collaborations and all kinds of things, uh, boundaries and safe spaces and all those things. I had no concept of those prior to that. And so it's, it's didn't really stick though. It, 
nothing was really concrete. And so I wanted to create something to serve as a model for people to see this actually works. And if you just stick to it long enough, things start to happen. And so I created Rewild Portland and we did a monthly free skill series. Actually, when we first were doing it, we were doing it like every weekend, which ended up not really being viable for my energy level. But we ended up doing this free skill series where we were teaching people classes for free once a month in the park. And eventually the park found out we were offering free classes in the park and we had insurance. We were an official nonprofit. And so they actually sponsored us with permits because they were like, wow, this is great. This goes hand in hand with our mission and our goals. And we can send our environmental educators that work with kids and families to these free skill series that you're offering. So they can also um, essentially get like staff development for the programming that they teach that is also environmental education. Um, so it ended up being a really great relationship there in terms of um, allowing us to do this and, and creating more access for people who didn't really have it. And so for years and years, I ended up just, you know, obviously I was working day jobs during this time. I worked as a production coordinator in the film industry. I worked as an environmental educator sometimes. I worked at a food cart, um, a paleo, paleo diet food cart here in Portland, and, and eventually the restaurant that turned into. I worked at a Waldorf school. Eventually, Rewild Portland kind of had enough momentum to become my sole income, which is great. And that's what I do now. A large part of that was after years of stepping away from the public. So when I was Urban Scout and doing all that stuff as a blogger, I was very much in the public eye. And Urban Scout had a very specific reputation. You know, the the muse or the voice of Urban Scout was a bit confrontational. I don't know if confrontational is the right word, but I think like George Carlin, uh, clown of rewilding, right? I say the F word a lot. <laughs> um, and I was a little bit instigatory. Maybe that's a better, you know, I, was in, I would in, instigate things. And I was known for that, right? So I got a reputation for that. And I'm, it's weird for me to say I was known for that because I'm not Urban Scout. I'm Peter Bauer. I'm Peter Michael Bauer. And I had to kind of step back into the public eye after several years and, and have people see me for who I am, not who this character was. So um, it's been a little bit of a process for that, but also in terms of making rewilding a little bit more, taking it more seriously now. In 2008, I compiled all of the essays I had written on my blog and published it as a book. However, I didn't really start promoting the book until about 2010 um, when I did the official promotion, but it was essentially finished in 2008 based on that it was a collection of blogs that had been written and posted and been online for years. Um, and so, you know, the book was out there. I went on a book tour in 2011, and in each town I went to, I held a free skill series. So the idea being if people were inspired by the book, by the work, by the book reading itself would become a place for local community social networking in the places that I went on my book tour. So it wasn't just me talking or reading from a book. All I ever want is to bring people together around these ideas. And so by going on a book tour, instead of making it just a talking head of ideas, the plan was to basically try to instigate free skill series and communities around rewilding in each town that I went to. I don't know how effective that was. <laughs> um, I'll have to check back in with those people. It's been years. So I stepped out of the public eye as an urban scout, as anything, from around 2009. And even though my book tour was in 2011, I wasn't really writing anymore. I was just solely focused on getting Rewild Portland off the ground as an organization. And it wasn't until 2014 when... Um, I started seeing the word rewilding just popping up everywhere. And people started messaging me and saying, oh, this person's plagiarizing you. That person's copying you. Did you see this thing? This word is being used. So I've, for years, I've had rewild and rewilding on um, Google Alerts where I get notifications every time the word is used. And I just read it up because, you know, when, when you're obsessed with a, a word like this and it sums up a lot of your ideology, you want to kind of maintain that and protect that. Uh, even though it's not my intellectual property per se, it's a collective intellectual property. It's a collective worldview. And so if it goes astray, um, it's like a rebranding of our whole concept. So even as an organization, legally, uh, we want to protect that word since the name Rewild Portland is our the name of our business. So we have to protect it on the business side of things, but also just as a community, we have to protect it. And one of the ways that we protect it is by having it non-trademarkable. Um, and that was intentional going forward when we created the business. 
was that we did not want it to be able to trademark it because everybody should should be able to use this word. That doesn't mean that everybody should use the word um, or that we're not going to get fierce about how it's being used and protect the way it's being used um, to protect our own ideas. And so it was 2014 when people started telling me about different folks that had been using it. I was looking them up. They seemed kind of boring, Um, but it was detrimental in my mind to how people had been perceiving the word rewilding. And some of these people were, you know, your classic online capitalist social media guru sociopaths, frankly. Uh, and so it was weird to see the word rewilding being placed in and, and essentially a rewilding light, you know, for the masses without all of the important things in it, everything cut out and just being like, here's some life hacks that we're calling rewilding uh, because you've been domesticated or something, right? Which is totally not the point. And again, we'll get into some of the the deeper level conversation of what rewilding is later on in this podcast. So it was during that time when I, I realized I needed to jump back into the public sphere and really start promoting our, the ideas of rewilding again and kind of take up that mantle that I had set down with Urban Scout, but take it up in a way that was going to be a bit more professional and a bit more widely appealing. Um, went on a whole bunch of podcasts to talk about rewilding. I re-put out Rewild or Die with better copy editing and better typeface and all that kind of stuff. But the most important thing I started to do was teach these rewilding 101 classes in person here in Portland, which completely changed basically everything that I do in terms of my rewilding and, and, and really made me hone in on my public speaking, hone in on just what rewilding is through that interaction with people in person, in real life, having conversations. So, you know, I, while a lot of my teaching is didactic and lecture based, there's a lot of it that is discussion based to you. I love it when people raise their hand and bring up something or challenge something I said, and then we can sit down and have a conversation and work through it because, you know, this is how ideas evolve. And so while I think of myself as I'm not an expert in rewilding because Rewilding isn't something you can become an expert in per se, but I'm a spokesperson for how we are defining it and how it changes over time. I'm essentially, you know, a vehicle through which the entire community is morphing and massaging this word and this idea, and I'm just a mouthpiece for it. Um, I'm one mouthpiece of many. However, I like to think of myself as a catalyst. So there's this movement now of rewilding. And it's important to recognize all of these different catalysts and all of these different people who are part of this movement. And this is really segueing into this podcast because this podcast is not going to be just me as a mouthpiece talking. That would be boring. This podcast is me connecting with other catalysts in this movement, both visible and invisible being, meaning those that are not necessarily on social media or those that are doing things a little bit more underground who, who don't want to have a limelight, right. But are equally invested in this movement, even whether or not they call it rewilding. Right. So there's a whole other aspect there of like what I consider rewilding. Some people don't call it that. And so there's a whole interesting thing there. What I'm calling rewilding, I want more people to, to think of and see it and embrace that because I think it gives it more power and momentum. However, in 500 years, anyone who is alive on this planet will have been a rewilder or have done rewilding in order to survive because this is the only way forward. And when I say only, of course, what I'm talking about is thousands and thousands of diverse ways. Rewilding isn't a single way. Rewilding is a is a principle or a lens with which to see the world in terms of regeneration and reciprocity. It is not a one right way to live. It is a million ways to live that are in the flow of natural cycles that recognize humans are not above those flows, but actually are more beneficial when we become part of them. In this podcast, I'm going to interview my friends. I'm going to interview my colleagues and my heroes and people that just inspire me that may have nothing. They might not even know what rewilding is or have never heard of it before, but something they're doing is a huge piece of the puzzle. And that's one of the reasons why I love this medium and love this, the banner or framework of rewilding is because we can tap into all these different subcultures that are doing really amazing things 
that may or may not even understand that they're part of this larger picture. So part of the podcast for me is about connecting these dots and re- making people realize they are part of this larger flowing movement that exists and has actually, to be honest, existed ever since civilization has existed because ever since civilization has existed, people have resisted it and people have tried to embrace wildness and people fight to embrace wildness everywhere civilization attempts to domesticate them. So rewilding is nothing new. In fact, it's been going ever since civilization was the the first civilization arose. It's important to recognize that, that what we're calling rewilding is just the latest term for something that is ancient and embedded in us because Wildness is always trying to find its way back out. And the processes of civilization that hold us captive, that make us dependent on these systems, that leave us domesticated, those processes are so involved and require so much energy that our wildness is bound to come back. There's no way you can fight wildness. I mean, think about all of the systems that are in place, all of the energy consumption that goes into fighting wildness. And you get that sense of like, actually, if we just stopped fighting this, life would be a lot better. (laughs) So after running the free skills series for almost 10 years, well, we've run it for 10 years now, a couple years back, I realized that we needed to have a, have a larger conference. So not just the regular free skills series that happens regularly in Portland, but a larger scale conference that brought people from all over the country or all over the continent or all over the world, really. Um, And that's when I devised the Rewilding Conference, or more specifically, the Annual North American Rewilding Conference, or ANARC. The idea behind that conference is to bring people together, not to focus on skills like handcrafts. I mean, there's a little tiny bit of that there, too, because that's fun um, and relatable and related to rewilding. But the main point of the conference is to talk about these ideas, because if we're just doing a thing, we're not actually deconstructing the way we think about them. And part of the problem, the large part of the problem is that the lens that we grew up that taught us how to think and look about the world is broken and in fact is doing all of this damage. So if we want to create a new way to live, we need to completely rewire our brains. And we do that in part through conversation, through the sharing of ideas. And so the Rewilding Conference is essentially a way of bringing people together to share the ideas around rewilding so that we can make those cross-cultural, personal, deep connections with people there, but also exchange these ideas and have our way of thinking completely changed in the way of rewilding. So the conference is three days, and it's, well, it's four days if you include the the night before, which is our keynote, an opening keynote. Um, And then Friday is classes structured classes. Saturday is an open space. Sunday morning is hands in the dirt classes off campus from where the conference happens. And then we come back Sunday afternoon for the last half of open space. Um, If you don't know what open space technology is, it's really amazing. I highly recommend um, just Googling open space technology. Um, It's a great democratic anarchist way of solving a problem, talking about big issues and, um, thinking rhizomally, basically non-hierarchical connections, how to network the community members through ideas and get all of that cross-pollination without the information having to be disseminated top-down. It's going across the rhizome, um, like a mycelium network. Uh, So open space technology is super cool, but we also want to make sure that we're, for those people who are a little bit shy or don't feel comfortable leading an open space or, you know, don't want to participate in that aspect of it. It's uncomfortable for whatever reason who like the idea of just being taught information directly from a teacher didactically. Um, We are including the Friday classes this year. So people will actually be able to um, just attend classes from people we consider to be catalysts of rewilding. Again, whether or not they consider themselves that is a separate issue. But to me, the people that we're selecting that our team at Rewild Portland is selecting to be a part of the conference are people who overlap with the mission and vision of rewilding. So again, in this podcast, I'm going to be interviewing my friends, colleagues, heroes, all the people that inspire me in regards to various aspects of rewilding. And yes, that might be, I'll, I'll try to do my best at tying in so that you can see how this relates to the larger vision of re, of what rewilding is. And just to speak before I go, 
back to uh, the point that I was talking about earlier in terms of how I define rewilding and how my definition of it um, from back in the day to return to a more wild or natural state, the process of undoing domestication has changed over the years. The problem with using the framework of domestication is that there is this problematic binary created in this ideology of things that are wild and things that are domesticated. Um, and I don't see a binary system here. What I see is a river, okay? Imagine a river that's flowing and somebody's swimming down the river and then they stop and they start to swim upstream from the river. Eventually their muscles are gonna get tired and they're not gonna be able to do it, right? They're gonna eventually get pushed back to the flow. But if you go with the flow of this river, you're not gonna have any issues. You're not gonna struggle. And so there isn't a binary system here. If somebody's swimming up river from, instead of going with the flow, they're fighting the current. I see wildness, I look at it as willed, as in free will. And so when we look at what rewilding means, to me, it's understanding that every living thing, every moving thing has a will, a force of nature. Everything is a force of nature. And our forces combine together and create congress of wills that we call ecosystems. If you look at evolution, you know, they used to call it survival of the fittest. And it was like this sort of that people interpreted that as aggression and strength. But really, if we look at evolution, those that survive in the long run are the ones that blend and bend to the ecosystems. Um, it's survival of the fit. Who can fit in the ecosystem that already exists, right? And so if we think about this as wills, as the will or the autonomy or the force of nature of all of these moving things all coming together and sort of swirling together and playing a role rather than fighting, fighting these wills, um, you can kind of recognize a little bit more of what that means to go with the flow is rewilding, not necessarily um, to just, you know, if there's a predator coming to kill you that you just let it kill you. That's not what I'm saying either. Um, that's not that's not going with the flow, because um, think about it like magnets. Right. And there's these magnets that kind of push and pull and there's high pressure and low pressure and everything is just kind of swirling around in Congress with one another. Nothing is trying to stop stop the cycle from happening. Nothing is trying to stop the wheel from turning or the cloud from shifting into different things. That to me is what civilization has done. We have arrested the development or arrested the natural cycles of things. And that has to do with our agricultural practices, basically deforesting regions and having a perpetual field. So if we look at a cycle of succession, uh, you have a disturbance that wipes out a forest or a biodiverse ecosystem and slowly the ecosystem builds back up to more complexity and more diversity and then a disturbance happens and the cycle starts over again however if you suspend that cycle um, it's kind of like entropy where eventually it's not if it's not cycling up and creating biodiverse and biomass and complex ecosystems, but you're just keeping it at this prime, uh, the, sort of a primacy, which is essentially what agriculture does. We deforest regions, we plant annual plants who are supposed to be pioneer plants who come in and um, colonize an area and then eventually create soil so more developed ecosystems can arise or, or more complex and more diverse ecosystems come out of those pioneer plants. But if you just keep the same pioneer plants going year after year after year, you degrade the soil and eventually it washes away and becomes a desert wasteland, which is why, you know, we call the fertile, we, the, what once was what we call the fertile crescent is now a irradiated desert wasteland, salted desert wasteland where nothing grows. So if we look at this whole system, to me, rewilding is about embracing this cycle, embracing the cycle of flow rather than suppressing or arresting it. And when we get down into it, if you look at how we treat animals and plants and all these other things, we're holding them captive. We've arrested their development. One of the main components of what we call domestication, so side note, domestication, the word, like scientifically refers to biological traits that reveal altered, basically altered biology that shows human tending or human control. So if something is domesticated, that means that it has biological traits that show that humans have been controlling it, whether through removing it from other elements of its ecosystem or intentional breeding, selective breeding. Anna Tsing is a really great anthropologist who refers to domestication as the process of alienation. And this really 
connects in here because if you think of domestication as alienation, it's that removal of an entity from the will, the Congress of wills, the, all of those flows of other things that starts to degrade it and make it less and less resilient. Um, because offense, for example, is limiting an animal's interactions with the ecosystem that it's a part of. And when you limit those interactions for thousands of years, you've degraded the resilience of that animal's ability to survive if the fence ever goes away, when of course it will because we don't control the world, right? So we've basically built in this system that has lessened the resi resilience and suppressed our ability to connect with one another, to connect with the other elements and members of the community of life and ecosystems that surround us. And so in order to get back to that, that's rewilding. Um, and so it's a process, it's a lens, it's a life way, it's a worldview. It is not a capitalist mean, it's not a, a product to be sold to make money as a capitalist. It is a gateway to freedom. It is a gateway to a resilient, livable planet. And of course, the more we talk and the more we use rewilding as a word, the more people start doing it, the more ripe it gets for capitalist exploitation. And this is a large part why I have started this podcast, because I want to make sure that the voices being heard in the rewilding movement are those that are catalysts for escaping civilization, for another worldview, not for making our lives simply more comfortable or like a human zoo. So back to the arrested development, one of the ways in which civilization makes us dependent and that we see uh, biological traits of domestication is what is called neoteny, which uh, is selective breeding to extend childhood. That's why, you know, cats meow, for example, no adult feline wild animals meow, but cats have this infantile meow as part of their domestication. Uh, there's a lot more in that. I don't want to get into that part of this. But the most important here thing here is that rewilding is not, as I said 10 years, 13 years ago, rewilding is not the process of undoing domestication. Rewilding is the process of embracing wildness. And why that is not semantics and why that is so important is because the, the example I use is classic, uh, what is it, Godwin's Law? Here I am, I'm going to bring up the Nazis. But they did this experiment, so they were obsessed with eugenics, right? And wildness, um, what they thought was wildness. And again, this harkens back to that idea of evolution, of survival of the fit, of aggression and competition. And so to them, wildness was an aggressive animal. They wanted to recreate the auroch. The auroch is the wild ancestor of the domesticated cow. And so the Nazis bred a domesticated cow to look like an auroch and have a high amount of aggression. But that cow wasn't any less domesticated than its other cows. Just because it looked like an auroch and was aggressive didn't make it wild because it was also selectively bred for what they thought was wild not through the real wild, which is the interaction and Congress with the other wild things in the world. They shape us. We don't decide what wildness is for ourselves. Wildness is created in Congress with the community of life that we live in. So this is the most important thing here, I think, in terms of where rewilding rests now. Because if you're trying to control for undoing domestication, you're going to fuck up because you have an idea of what wildness is, specifically certain traits or anything like that. And if you're trying to work those out, but you're not actually in Congress with the forest, with those other wild things, with the willed creatures, plant, animals, clouds, weather patterns, the, the place where you live, if you're not in Congress with that in a subsistence manner, but are just projecting this type of philosophy, you know, civilized ideology on top of it, you're not really rewilding. And that to me is one of the bigger um, issues in terms of how I define rewilding with how I think a lot of other people see it. Um, and I haven't even got into conservation rewilding. So maybe I'll talk about that for a minute here. Conservation rewilding came about also in the early aughts, late 90s. I think there was a book published in the late 90s. Um, with the word rewild in it. And since then has gained popularity, particularly in places where there isn't a lot of quote unquote wilderness left. So 
um, Europe, basically, which has been deforested a long time ago. There are still some like national parks and things like that in countries, but for the most part, they don't have large tracts of quote unquote wilderness. But a lot of these concepts of wilderness also stem from this idea of humans being inherently destructive. So this harkens back to our conversation earlier of the Terminator. It's in your nature to destroy yourselves. So when we look at natural systems, we don't understand the human niche. In my Rewilding 101 class, this latest session, I was talking to my friend Tia, who's PhD, studied biology, all this stuff. And, and I asked the question, what is the human niche in the ecosystem? And it blew her away to realize that was never a question ever addressed in any of the ecological classes that she's ever taken. That is absurd. Just sit with that for a minute, right? What is the human niche in an ecology? No one knows. And that's because they've ignored all the indigenous people who've been living in their ecologies, not perceiving them, one, as fully human, or two, as not fully developed their potential yet. So, you know, we have like this myth of looking at indigenous people and projecting this idea, well, they were going to start writing soon. They were going to start civilization. Like this is the inevitable, this is progress, but that's actually a myth. That's not true at all. And in fact, if we look at the, the, the destruction that civilization has wreaked on the planet is absolutely not progression. It is a short-term gain, long-term loss. This is the sixth extinction. So we're dealing with some very serious issues here. This is not progress, right? So if we look at this conservation ideology, it stems from the idea that humans are inherently destructive. So when they're talking about wild spaces or wilderness, they're not looking at humans being a component of that, which is a huge mistake and a huge misunderstanding of humans. Just because civilized people who've been civilized for thousands of years don't have a concept of what humans might look like in a regenerative relationship with the wild and with their place doesn't mean that we can't do that, especially because there's so many great examples of cultures all over the world that still do and have done um, prior to their own colonization that still have a record of it, that still have living memory, that still practice these things. So if we look at conservation rewilding, I think eventually they're going to get it. I think eventually they're going to realize that real wild spaces have a place for humans and humans have a place in those wild spaces and not just any old place like, oh, we're just like limping along. I think we have an integral part to play in those things. I mean, there's already studies that talk about the, the Amazon rainforest being a keystone, you know, humans being a keystone species in the Amazon, believing that perhaps humans played a key role in creating the Amazon. So if we can create a role in creating, if we have a role in creating the Amazon, or if we played a role, I mean, obviously we did play a role because, or the humans who lived there played a role because they lived there for thousands, tens of thousands of years without completely destroying the whole thing, right? So in terms of rewilding, looking at it as a conservation rewilding, I think eventually they're going to get to it. And I think it's going to come through understanding what's called traditional ecological knowledge, which a lot of conservationists here in North America have found a way of integrating indigenous knowledge into conservation through what they call traditional ecological knowledge. And again, one of my aims with this rewilding conference is to bring in all of these different ideas of rewilding and really start to get them to meet across the path. It's important for people to, to reach across these lines of defining rewilding so that we can work together and have a better idea of our future. We can't continue to live on this planet if people think that humans aren't, uh, if, if people think that humans are horrible animals that don't deserve to live. That That conflates civilization with humanity. Humanity didn't do all of these things. Humanity didn't create civilization civilizationists did. The Bushmen are still living probably as much as similar as they could have uh, as they were 10,000 years ago. So it's not an inevitability for humanity. There were certain groups that did this and we're just now f trying to figure out how to get through it because it's the end of it. Um, it the energy, it's like a for, I, I look at civilization as a forest fire and I'm going to define civilization real quick here because I know this is another one of those things people don't understand. If I if I say the Bushmen don't have a civilization, people conflate that word with civil society and they're like, no, they have a civilization, you're being racist or something like that. I want to be clear. So if you look up the definition of civiliz civilization in the American heritage, it says an advanced state of intellectual, cultural, and material development in human society marked by progress in the arts and sciences, the extensive use of record keeping, including writing, and the appearance of complex political structures and social institutions. So just to kind of jump into that and, and 
look through that. So this is like a dictionary. It's written by the people who created this. So it's going to be a fluff piece, right? So when it says the word advanced state of intellectual, that's a cultural value being imposed onto it. But what I'm really seeing here is record, extensive use of record keeping. And that doesn't come with any other society other than those that are storing food through agriculture. Um, and if you're doing that, you're already demolishing your land base. And we'll, we can get into that some other time, or you can read my book, Rewild or Die. <laughs> um, but the one of the things I want to point out here is that it says the appearance of complex political and social institutions. That's basically a way of saying slavery. All of these systems were built on slaves, different kinds of slaves. So my definition of civilization is one that recognizes these things and, and sort of pulls the, the value statements out of those and looks at civilization as an alien ecologist might. And so my definition of civilization is a catastrophe or a disturbance, a great disturbance created when human culture practices full-time agriculture, causing their population to spiral into a cycle of exponential growth, social hierarchy, soil depletion, and genocidal expansion that leads to an eventual collapse of ecosystems, biological diversity, and culture. So just so we know we're on the same page, that's how I'm defining civilization. And I think that's one of those important things to get into, again, when when rewilding is about completely changing the way we see the world. Some of the words are going to be problematic, but part of that is something that we can feature. We can be like, yes, let's redefine this together collectively. And so that's one of the things that I try to do with rewilding as well. So this podcast is going to be an exploration of all of these kinds of things. And I could rant and rant and rant for hours about this stuff and, and lecture, et cetera. Uh, but I really want to get into the people that I know and love that are catalysts in this movement, the people that inspire me, the people that I'm thinking, wow, you, your thinking is so far ahead. Your actions are so far ahead. You're, you're doing really amazing work. And other people need to know and feel inspired by you too. I'll also be spending some time in different episodes responding to listeners' questions about rewilding. So if you've got a question, you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter and send me your questions there. It's hard to know when to stop talking as rewilding is a never-ending conversation to me, but um, I'm going to wrap it up here for today. I hope this first episode has filled in some gaps for you, uh, gave you some more context to understand where I'm coming from. And uh, I hope you have more questions and thoughts to share as well. Most of all, I hope that I've got you excited for all the things to come on the Rewilding Podcast. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.